Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. How do you talk to your children about loss? What secrets do you decide to keep, and for how long? And when do you decide to tell them everything? Emily Listfield tells the story of how she faced those questions in her piece, What the Sea Took Away, A Daughter Restores. It's read by Carmen Ejogo. She starred in Selma as Coretta Scott King, and you can see her in the new season of True Detective on HBO. Fourteen years ago, my husband vanished. A talented sculptor whose work was in major collections, he had been in a downward spiral for over a year, unable to finish a single piece of work, tumbling into alcoholism, paralyzed by depression. After ten years of marriage, he moved into his studio in Lower Manhattan, while I stayed in our nearby apartment with our five-year-old daughter, Sasha. We spoke every day, often more honestly than we had in years, about the drinking that was destroying our marriage, the demons he had faced and triumphed over in the past, and why he couldn't fight them now. Most of all, we spoke of Sasha. He adored her, and despite everything, remained a doting father. I hoped the separation would make him face what he was in danger of losing. His family, the ability to create art, and get the help he needed. Instead, he went to Florida to stay with a woman he had dated in college and fell further into an alcohol-soaked haze, filled with self-blame, unreachable. At midnight, on an August night, a few days before he was to return home, he apparently swam into the ocean as far as he could go and didn't come back. Apparently is the word that came to define his death and my life for years to come. My husband's body was never found. The woman he was staying with waited four days to call the police. When they arrived, they found his ID, credit cards, unused airline ticket to New York, and two drawings. One said, drowned. The other, lonely head, dead. For the first few days, I told Sasha nothing. I clung to the hope that my husband would be found in a hospital, would magically appear at the airport for his return flight, or, worst case scenario, that his body would be discovered in some weedy cove. None came to pass, and I discovered there is something worse. Absence without answers. Finally, I had no choice but to tell Sasha her father had disappeared, and we didn't know what had happened. Each night she asked if there was news, her legs twirling in agitation. The horror of losing a much-loved parent exacerbated by the quicksand of uncertainty. If the world could swallow up one parent without a trace, what protection is there? Six weeks later, As I began to accept that we might never have answers, I lied and told Sasha the police knew for sure her father had died. 
We held a memorial service, and Sasha began to heal. Questions naturally arose. When she was eight, Sasha turned to me out of the blue and said, Mum, the police don't really know for sure what happened, do they? The story she was so ready to believe at six was proving leaky. She began to make up better endings. In school, she wrote tales of a man who ventured into the ocean at night, only to discover he had forgotten how to swim. Always in her stories, he was rescued by mermaids or suddenly reclaimed his aquatic ability. And upon his return to shore, his wife was furiously yelling, What were you thinking? I held firm in my conviction that her father had died that night. I wanted most to spare Sasha the realization that there would always be a black hole in the center of our lives. For the inevitable question, where is your father? I gave her a pat answer. Just say he drowned. You don't need to explain more than that. I had found in my own life, particularly as I started dating again, that the surreal and open-ended nature of what had happened was as disturbing to listeners as to me. Nevertheless, Sasha instead replied, I have no father. On school form, she wrote, None rather than deceased. The few times she tried to explain the situation in more detail, she was bombarded with questions she could not answer. Still, I found it unsettling that she was erasing a father who, despite his struggles, had loved her deeply. Eventually, I published a novel based on the story. And while the act of shaping the narrative helped me to move on, I was worried how Sasha, then 14 and an inveterate reader, might react. I prepared a speech to give her with the book, stressing that I would be happy to answer any questions about her father's death. And I waited. But the novel languished on her bedside table for three years before she opened it. She claimed to be too busy. She kept pictures of her father in her room, but she never again inquired about the details of his disappearance. My version was her version. My life story, hers. Until now. Sasha, 20 years old and a junior in college, received an assignment to write a life story only she could tell. I want to write about Dad, she texted me. At first, she intended to make it an impressionistic essay about how his death had shaped her. But her professor had another idea. She suggested Sasha approach it as an investigative piece. My first response was outrage. How could this woman have any idea what she was asking? I had long tried to shield my daughter from the vortex of uncertainty. The last thing I wanted was for her to start poking around, reaching out to people from years ago who may harbour conflicting theories. One lone police detective still insisted my husband must be alive somewhere, and it had taken me seven years to get a death certificate. My professor said you might be a bit hesitant or protective, Sasha said. It's my life too, and I've been thinking about doing this for a while. We tell our children the stories of our lives to shape our shared history, to give them identity and meaning, and sometimes to protect them. At some point, though, they will yank the story from our hands and make it theirs. 
I agreed to help Sasha. Nevertheless, my inclination was to try to control the flow of information. I called my husband's best friend from Florida and his brothers, alerting them to Sasha's coming inquiries. I asked them to keep the door closed on any questions they may have about his death, though they assured me they had none. A few days later, Sasha emailed to say she had decided to turn the assignment into a multimedia project. She asked for photos of the police reports, the Coast Guard charts of the tides the night her father died, the private investigator records. On a wintry afternoon, I opened a box that had been shut for years and began snapping pictures with my iPhone. The official documents, the unused airline ticket for his trip back to New York, the address book the police found that still had the hearts he had drawn around my name when we first started dating. For all of my fears, though, It was not her father's death that ended up interesting Sasha. She accepted it as fact. Sad, bizarre, haunting, incontrovertible. It was his life that she wanted to learn about. His single-minded determination awed her. Did you know that Daddy lived in an abandoned building when he was in college and ate canned soup so he could put all his money into his art? She asked me. It was that burning ambition, that will to create, that I first fell in love with, I told her, realising now how little I'd spoken of it. Do you have any idea what made him so committed to sculpture? She asked. I remembered a photograph of him at seven with his mother, a dressmaker in Germany, standing at the table while she cut patterns, eerily similar to his later work. I hadn't looked at it in a decade, but I sent it to Sasha along with photos from his shows, a list of his collectors, reviews of his work before the bottom fell out, stories I willfully had forgotten in the effort to forge a new life. Sasha was hungry for detail, and I did my best, digging up shards of a past that felt at once distant and immediate. But the sadness that descended on me did not spill over to her. She was too busy filling in pieces and stitching them together. It is a particularly American story, I told her of a boy who came to this country at eight not speaking a word of English. A teenager who left a difficult home and put himself through college and graduate school. An artist who succeeded magnificently and failed miserably, felled by his own addiction. In the end, the story she wrote was about a man who redefined himself through art a man of overwhelming talent and fatal flaws. I had spent 14 years trying to protect my daughter from her father's death, and she gave me back his life. That's Carmen Ajogo reading Emily Listfield's essay, What the Sea Took Away, A Daughter Restores. We'll catch up with Emily after the break. When we talked to Emily Listfield, she told us what it was like to become a single parent after her husband's disappearance. For the first two years, I was just so tired. You're in survival mode. And trying to provide as much structure, I really do believe that to get children through any kind of crisis structure and regularity is very important. I was honest with her about how sad I was, but I didn't want her to see it all the time, so I would 
drop her off at school, cry on my way to work, do my job, cry on my way home, and then be mom. Emily says that she had no choice but to keep it together. I remember a friend of mine said to me, I would have had a breakdown. And I'm like, oh, no one told me that was an option. I thought I still had to get my kid to school every day and get a job. Among other very prosaic matters was if there's no body, there's no life insurance, and you're suddenly the sole support of your family. So I got through it that way. I also had family nearby and had a very close network of friends who could help out. She also had to work through her own emotions about what had happened. I was hurt and angry, and it veered back and forth. There was one night within the first few weeks where I was so angry that in the middle of the night, I started throwing out anything he'd ever touched. And there were other times that I was angry because he wouldn't see his child grow up. And how could he do that to her? Emily says that for a while, she saw the apparent suicide as a selfish act. There was one night, about two years into this, when I just was in so much pain, and I thought, oh, this is why someone does it. You can just end that pain. And I knew he was in pain. I also knew that I was a parent and could never do that. But he thought he was doing us a favor. And again, alcoholism was at the root of a lot of this. Or everything, I must say. It's been almost 10 years since Emily's husband went missing. Sasha is in law school now, and she's finally read the book her mother wrote about her father's disappearance. When I first wrote a book about this, she didn't read it for three years. And then she finally did, and she was in Washington, D.C., and she went to the Library of Congress. And she asked for the book, and it came an hour later, and she sat there and she said the dedication was to her and in memory of her father. And she said, so we'll be together there for hundreds of years. That's Emily Listfield. The book is called Waiting to Surface. Emily is the author of six other books. She lives in New York City. We've got more from Carmen Ajogo after the break. Here's Carmen Ajogo. Well, I think there's something very, a, a deeply personal connection to this particular story for me as somebody that lost their own father in somewhat mysterious circumstances and had to create my own narrative over years. And it's human nature to sort of find ways to survive something that is deeply painful or confusing or disturbing in some way that you will find narratives that speak to you, even if you've been fed another story by those that love and want to protect you. So I think that this idea of being fed one story and then coming up with your own, and then ultimately trying to discover who the, what the best side of the person was in life rather than in death is where I came to as well. So uh, it really resonated on very personal levels. Thanks again to Carmen for reading this week's piece. Carmen stars in season three of HBO's True Detective. And here's Modern Love editor Daniel Jones. Well, Emily's essay really asked this question of what do you do with stories that are too dark for children? Even though it's the child's story, how do you, and at what point do you tell stories about that and how much of the truth do you tell and what I thought the real beauty of her essay is is that at some point the child is going to grow up and want to claim that story as her own and the way that the child in this case is able to spin that around and give that back to her mother almost as a gift (laughs) this project of sort of reclaiming her father and her father's life and the brightness about that and God, it's just so beautifully written and poignant and bright at the same time. Next week, Joanna Kulig. 
Then one morning, 16 years after fleeing my hometown, I opened my email at home in San Jose, California, to find Marco's name in the inbox. His message read, If you are Nicolina from Mostar, then I have been your boyfriend since fifth grade. Please get back to me so we can figure out what to do. Modern Love is a production of the New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, Caitlin O'Keefe, and John Parati. Original scoring and sound design by Matt Reed. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for the New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. If you love the show, tell your friends about us. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. See you next week.